Well, hello everyone. It is Carol Freeman here. I am the creator of the Fast Track to Keto Success Program, and I am so excited today to be here with Amy Berger. I am so lucky to be uh, talking with her. So I'm over in the Seattle area. You're over in New York, right? Uh, no, I have a New York phone number, but I'm actually just outside Washington, D.C. Oh, okay, okay. How's your, how's your weather over there right now? Today, it's overcast and rainy, but that's my favorite. I'm weird. Okay. I like bad weather, so I'm happy. Oh, you should move to Seattle. It would be perfect for yeah, you then. <laughs> I have thought of doing that at Seattle or Portland, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. We would, we would love you. So, uh, well, Amy, for those people who are watching who don't know you, you are a nutritionist and a passionate nutritionist at that. Can you just give us... Um, how do you how do you identify yourself? How do you introduce yourself when people ask who you are? Um, well, I guess I well, it's it's hard to believe there's people out there who don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, I'm I'm amazed that anyone does know me to be honest. But um, I I say that I'm I'm a nutritionist and I'm low carb paleo ketogenic oriented. Okay. And that word oriented means that I don't exclusively do that, but that's sort of the areas I focus on. Okay. You know, like I don't, I mean, if somebody comes to me, they shouldn't expect that I'm going to put them on a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet. I'm not saying those are good or bad. I just, that's not what I work with. Okay. Nice. Nice. So how did you get interested in nutrition? You have a master's degree in nutrition from where? Uh, University of Bridgeport up in Connecticut. Okay. Okay. So how, what was your path? How did you get to that degree? Um, it's, it's the same story. Probably a lot of people have out there who come into this field, whether it's nutrition or personal training or even being a doctor. Um, I was trying to help myself, you know, I've, I've worked in a lot of different careers and in a couple of different industries and nothing ever really was satisfying to me. Nothing mm -hmm. felt like I was doing something fun and something that I really cared about. Um, I was definitely a clock watcher. Hey, is it five o'clock yet? <laughs> and I had, I've always been a little bit chubby, a little bit overweight. I was never, you know, really obese, but I had always been a little heavy. And that was despite eating what I thought at least was a good diet, lots of exercise. I've, I've been in the Air Force. I've run two marathons. You know, I'm not afraid of a hard workout. I'm not afraid of exercise. Um, and, you know, I grew up, I, I was born in 78, so I grew up in the 80s and 90s, smack dab in the middle of the low fat, lots of carbohydrate thing. Yeah. And, and I did that. And um, I was never sick. You know, I, thank goodness I was never really ill or debilitated with anything, but I was chubby despite doing quote unquote all the right things. Yeah. And it was toward the tail end of when I was in college that I got my hands on the Atkins book, the 1992 version. Ah. And, which yeah. had the margarine in it, right? Is that the version of the book that had the... I, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> but back then, I probably would have eaten the margarine. I mean, it was still yeah. fat. I just didn't know about the types of fat. Yeah. You know. yeah. But it, it made sense to me, just the, the science and the logic of what happens to your body when you cut back on carbohydrate, it made total sense. And then it made total sense why I wasn't losing weight, even though I was exercising so hard and eating lots of, you know, eating low fat. So... I, I kind of dabbled in low carb for a couple of years until it really stuck. It didn't really stick until, you know, the mid, I don't know, 2003 or four. Um, but it's been, it's been over 10 years now that I've been doing low carb, you know, with periods here and there of higher carbs, lower carbs, but I've never gone back to like a regular super high carb diet. I've always been on the lower side. And, um, after knowing what it could do for me and just being so fascinated by it and, and continuing to research as to why this works and how it works and what else happens on a low carb diet besides just weight loss, I just got so interested in it. And I said, you know, I think I could actually make a career of this. I think I could help other people do it. And this might actually be a career that I like, something that mm -hmm. I feel is valuable and that I feel fulfilled by. And so, um, like I said, like so many people who get into this industry, we get into it, I think, because we've sort of helped ourselves and we want to help other people. Yeah. Yeah. So you went, went for um, an official, official training and degree. I mean, there's so many people out there, you know, doing nutrition, whatever online that, that don't actually have the degree to back it up. And so. Uh, yeah, but, um, but I would say, I mean, 
I'm proud to have gotten a degree and I, I did it because in my personal opinion, I thought it was important. I wanted to have that leg to stand on. I didn't want to just be, you know, Amy's nutrition blog with no, no credentials, but yeah. I, I will say, I mean, and, and for people listening out there and watching, credentials are not all they're cracked up to be. I mean, there's plenty of people out there with credentials that have no clue what they're doing. And there's plenty of people with no credentials that know far more than I do. So yeah. it's, really, it's really just a matter of the person's knowledge base and experience because credentials are, they're good, but they don't mean a whole lot. I mean, look at all the MDs out there, all the doctors that are medical doctors, and, and yet we have millions upon millions of, of patients that never get relief, they never get help. So it's, um, I mean, I, I went for the credential mostly for my own self-confidence. I felt like I would be more comfortable just even giving advice in this if I had some sort of letters after my name. And that's, you know, that's not really the best reason to do it, but that's, that's what I did. <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, one of the things that I feel like, and maybe you, you experience this as well, is one of the things I felt like my degree did for me was train me how to look at research, um, you know, analyze research and understand what they were talking about and look at that a little bit more critically. And then understanding the biochemistry of how the body works as well is really helpful. And like you said, when you read Atkins, it's like, oh, this makes sense. Yeah, no, I think... Um what the the training in in the, the the steeping in the science did is that now i understand why the atkins book makes sense like it yeah, made sense yeah. to me but now i know biochemically why it works and um it, it you're exactly right i mean and when i read studies now it's um i feel more confident about my ability to, to interpret them whether you know is this a legitimate study can we actually trust this data or is it nonsense and i mean you take one statistics class and it kind of blows out of the water anything you ever thought about numbers so um, <laughs> yeah. maybe yeah. it blows your blows steam out your ears a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um well and and so tell me about your um the place you went to school, I'm assuming it's like a traditional nutrition program where they didn't really differentiate between, you know, all purpose flour and whole grain flour. And um, did, was there much discussion about the difference between whole foods, real foods versus, uh, you know, low fat yogurt or? Um, I was, I was very lucky. I chose my school specifically because I knew they would be a little bit more leaning in that direction. Um, I, I mean, I got my degree in nutrition after I already knew about low carb and paleo and all that. So I kind of, I wasn't going to go to a program that was going to tell me about the healthy whole grains and, and, you know, don't eat red meat and don't eat pork fat. Like I just wasn't going to do that. That's actually why I did not do the RD track, the registered dietitian. I just, and I'm not, I'm not trying to bash RDs. Like RDs are very smart people. They go through yeah. very long, difficult training, but I didn't want to have to memorize things that I knew to be incorrect just to pass a test. I just, I'm not going to waste my time that way. So um, the program bridge, I, I felt the Bridgeport would be more open to this type of thing because they are one of the five fully accredited naturopathic medical colleges in the U.S. So oh, I knew okay. that. Now, I mean, I went to the nutrition school that was separate from the naturopathic medical college, but knowing that they even had that program at that university told me that they were open to some other sort of paradigms about yeah. this, you know, and, and nat naturopathy gets a bad rap too. I, don't, I hope people aren't thinking like I'm some kind of quack because I think that that stuff can be legitimate. But I knew, I knew the Bridgeport was maybe not, a hundred percent in line with like keto and low carb, but they weren't going to teach me the food pyramid. And they didn't, I, I actually had some professors that, um, you know, maybe we're not telling people to just load up on butter, but definitely knew the benefits of at least cutting back on carbs. And, and all of them, I would say were into the real unprocessed foods, even if it was, you know, oats and potatoes, like in starchy foods, they weren't talking about, you know, Lucky Charm cereal. They were still talking about real food. Yeah. Oh, great. I didn't even know that about Bridgeport. So uh, I need to learn more about uh, that, that school. I didn't realize there was another um, naturopathic school or oriented school that also had nutrition programs. So that's, yeah, well, you live, you live near Bastia, right? You're in Washington. Right. That's where I have all my degrees from. And so, uh, um, you know, I'm, I thought I'm, 
living in this bubble out here of, uh, you know, the Seattle hippies and, you know, yeah. we still live in this, we, Seattle is really interesting. So you mentioned Portland, Oregon, and um, well, they have an osteopathic medical school too. Yeah, yeah. The one in, in Seattle area is, is much bigger. Um, but it's interesting, though, that the food scene in Portland is so much more progressive, like they have much more of a nose to tail you know, scene where they're using, you know, these traditional foods in, in restaurants that you can find really easily. Yeah. It's Portland. funny. I mean, Portland is, and it's the same thing here in Washington, DC. We have a lot of, you know, farm to table type restaurants mm. because we have so many great farms here in, in yeah. Maryland, Virginia, but as many, as much of that as there is, and there's, you know, you can go to restaurants and find roasted bone marrow and find, you know, liver pate, there's an equal number of like vegan restaurants. So it's right. Right. <laughs> yeah. When you're in a major progressive city, you have a lot of that sort of plant only. I refuse to use the word plant based plant only. So there's a lot of that plant only bias, but then there's yeah. at least it's like evened out with some of this more paleo, you know, animal fat type of thought. Well, you're, you're luckier than Seattle is, feels to me so far behind as far as, we still have pretty predominant vegetarian and vegan restaurants. We don't really have, you know, a good paleo option even, or, uh, you know, let alone a, you know, low carb focused um, restaurant. There is, there is one that opened up recently. That's a small one that uh, caters. Interestingly, they're really closely located to, I'm not going to say the name of it, but a very predominant um, uh a uh, chain that that is uh, calling themselves a ketogenic diet, but they, you know, it's very low fat, oh, the yeah. powders, and, you know, protein. Yeah, I know that one. That. So there's a restaurant that opened very close to a prominent um, location of that here that is supporting uh, the dinners that go along with that. So they're low fat, low carb uh, dinners. So protein dinners, basically. Uh -huh. um, but other other than that, um, well, and then interestingly, they, the same restaurant also offers vegetarian and vegan options as well. So that's quite a, a spectrum there. But we, we don't have, have a lot of options. We have a lot of, you know, biscuits and pizza uh, options and, yeah. and vegan options, but we don't, we don't have that. So it, have the, interesting, the interesting thing is, and I'm actually going to write a blog post about this soon, is that every restaurant is vegan and keto. Any restaurant right. you can go to and order a salad with vegetables is a vegan restaurant. Any restaurant you can go to and order a steak and broccoli that's a ketogenic restaurant. Like, I don't understand why. And Diane Sanfilippo from, from Balanced Bites and the author of Practical Paleo, I don't know if your viewers know who she is, but she's very well known in the paleo community. She did a podcast a while back where she said the same thing. I don't know why it's so difficult for people to go to a restaurant and order, like just ask for substitutions. Hey, you know, instead of the potato, can I get double vegetables? Instead of this, can I get that? I've never, I've been eating this way for more than 10 years. I've never been at a restaurant where there was literally nothing I could eat. <laughs> so like, if you're a vegan, you can still eat there. If you're a paleo, you can eat there. It just, I mean, it depends on me if you're worried about cross-contamination or like, you know, as a vegan, usually like they don't even want to eat in a facility that handles animal products. So I get that side of it, but I just, it's a lot easier than people think it is. I to I totally agree. When people ask, uh, you know, in my program members ask me like, well, what's a good keto restaurant? Like I find, like you said, almost any restaurant, the ones that are more challenging or, or maybe the, the vegans based restaurants or yep. like a, um, you know, an East Indian restaurant can be a little more challenging because there's, uh, you know, many carb based things, but other than that, yeah, any restaurant, you can very easily have very satisfying meals and you're yep. totally right. Well, so um, you are, I, I, I love, I love your blog. I shouldn't say it, mention it now because people are going to want to go look at it, but we will link to it at the end there. So don't worry. She gets, you'll get to see her fantastic blog, but I just love your, uh, you know, your passion, your wit, your uh, little bit of snark comes through in your, your, a lot of snark. Your, your blog. And it's, it's, um, I think it's, to me, it's really refreshing for people to really take a stand and, um, put, you know, put your, um, it's not only your views, it's just like really common sense stuff that nobody's saying. And, um, um, let's see. So there's gotta be, a, I've got to have a question related to this. So, um, well, how, how long ago did you, you start blogging and, um, was it just your creative outlet and it just has grown from there? Or? Um, I think my blog started in like summer or fall 2013. So it's been, okay. it's been a little over three years and it's, um, 
definitely my creative outlet because I'm, as much as I love nutrition and food, I will say at heart, I am a writer. I am a writer first and foremost. It's actually how I make my living. I mean, I do see clients, but the majority of my income comes from freelance writing in the nutrition and health world. I do a lot of um, freelance writing with this. So, oh, okay. Yeah, but the blog, the blog, at least, I get to say exactly what I want to say the way I want to say it. Whereas if I'm writing <laughs> to somebody else, they might have a special guide. They might give me rules to follow. My blog, I get to just vent and I do that a lot. <laughs> I think I'm actually getting a reputation for being really angry and ranting all the time and I want to cut back on that but um it's I don't think anyone was really reading my blog until sometime 2014 and I don't even know how it started. I think I just was writing and writing and the more you put out there the the more there is for people to find. Yes. Yeah. So I think and I I wasn't really active on Facebook at all until recently, but I was very active on Twitter and I would post new blog posts. And um, I honestly don't know how people found the blog, but now there's, I have a very small, but very loyal following. So. <laughs> well, and I can imagine that if you're writing for kind of mainstream uh, nutrition and health outlets, that that kind of brings up uh, the need to vent and let that out. Like I bet it gives you plenty of ideas for topics to write on. Well, I'm actually thinking about this and, yeah, I'm really fortunate. I don't write for mainstream nutrition publications. Okay. I write for publications that are low carb, keto, paleo friendly. Like I, I work, I work for a company called Designs for Health. You might know them if you went to Bastyr. They're a supplement company. Yeah. Okay. They call themselves the Paleo Company. Um, whether or not that's really true depends on what you think of their products. But they are definitely into the, you know, no soy, no not no gluten, but you know, they, they know all about that. They, they give me pretty good leeway to write about low carb. And I've written a lot of articles on ketogenic diets for them, which is nice. And oh, um, nice. Yeah. So I think, and other people that have approached me to freelance or to collaborate know that I'm low carb. Like they're not going to ask me to write an article about, you know, bread. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, that's, that's really cool. I'm learning so much about you. I love this. So, <laughs> yeah. um, now, um, let's talk about, so you, you, um, I'm gathering from what I've read on your blog that you have experienced a lot with working with people with, um, eating disorders or on that spectrum, especially orthorexia. Um, what do you, is that, am I off base or? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't specialize in that. I think, um, there is... I'm about to get in trouble and be very politically incorrect here, but there are a lot of people with overt or closeted eating disorders in this community. And yeah. there, I said it, the yeah. end. Yeah. That's the truth. Any, any eating philosophy with a label attached to it, whether it's low carb or paleo or keto or vegan or vegetarian is inevitably unavoidably going to attract people that need food rules, people that are scared to eat without food rules, people that have whatever issues around food. Um, I actually don't specialize in treating it or helping people with it. I mean, all I can really do is call them out on it and make them yeah. aware of it. Um, it's really, really hard to work with those people because they're terrified of food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I don't know. I don't think that gets enough attention in our community. I see it like now that I am more active on Facebook, I see so much of it and nobody ever calls it out how ridiculous it's getting. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's definitely uh, uh, a place for it and a lot of um, health improvements, but you're right. There's a lot of people that just that type A personality um, and maybe not even type A, but just you're right. That needs all these food rules and is afraid of food and um what, so what, what would you, you know, what advice do you have for somebody like that? I mean, what are some of the red flags that somebody might see? And I, I know from my own training that people that are in that state, it's really hard for them to even acknowledge that they're in that space. But um, do you have an idea of what are like some red flags that somebody might kind of look at themselves and go, wait a minute? Um, I think they know, you know, deep down, they know they're just maybe afraid to acknowledge it or admit it. Um, I just, I mean, usually what, 
what stands out to me is when, when I ask them about what they eat, how much they eat, you know, um, these people reach out to me for help. And I generally just say to them, you know, you're following this very, very strict diet, but you're not getting the results you want. Mm, you know, okay. if, if you were happy, if you felt well, if you were happy with the results, you wouldn't have called me, you know, you wouldn't be seeking help. And it's that, that usually gets through to them. I mean, whether or not they're ready to actually change is, you know, that usually doesn't happen overnight, but it kind of opens their eyes and it's, it gives them the, it's hard to explain. It gives them the, the freedom to, to let go, to say, maybe it's okay. Maybe, maybe I can be a little bit more relaxed and still be healthy and still be well and not gain a hundred pounds, you know? Um, like, I'm not saying the, those feelings aren't legitimate. I mean, there is a lot of fear out there. There's a lot of fear of gaining weight, fear of getting sick from, you know, too much omega-6 or too much this or that, because we've made these people terrified. I mean, this, to some extent, we've built this. Yeah. You know, it, it's our own doing. We've made people really scared of things that they maybe don't need to be that scared of. Um, but, re I mean, I can help the people like that with the food. I cannot help them with the psychological piece. Okay. I'm not, I'm not qualified to do it. I, it's not my area of interest. I don't even want to do it. I can bring it to their attention and say, I think you should probably consult somebody for help with this, Yeah. but I can do it myself. Yeah. I that's I say, usually it's the people that I find that are like that are people that at least when they started out, were already very, very healthy, very fit, very lean, very athletic. They just wanted, they're already at the 99th percentile and they wanted to get to 112. Okay. It's not the people that are, yeah, it's not the people that are at the, the 10th percentile that want to get to 50% that are really sick, really debilitated. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know if it's just the type A thing or it's just the people that are already so healthy and so obsessed with it and becoming more actually works against them. You know, and I'm not the only person who talks about this. Chris Crestor talks about it. Rob Wolf talks about it. You obsess with these things to the point that you actually become less healthy. Yeah. Well, like you said, the, you know, the telltale sign is that, you know, are, how, how are you feeling? How is this affecting your life? Like, right. that was one of the hallmarks I learned was that, you know, anything is, uh, you know, could be considered on the spectrum of disorder if it's causing distress in that person's life. And is this bringing you more joy and health or is this, uh, is this causing you more distress and discomfort? Exactly. Exactly. Is this, is this doing what you wanted to do? You're eating this way because you wanted to feel good. You wanted to have energy. You wanted to have your skin clear or whatever, whatever it is. Are you there or do you feel like garbage? And if you feel like garbage, you know, and I'm not like, I'm, I'm not saying that these people need to start eating junk food again, but I, like, I really, I get people that are following extremely strict, what I would call medically therapeutic ketogenic diets who do not need to be following that. Um, they could just eat what I call low carb yeah. and they probably feel a heck of a lot better. So it's like, it's not that I'm saying you shouldn't eat a healthy diet or, you know, just eat whatever you want, but open up the possibilities a little bit, you know? Yeah. I, I love that. And I couldn't agree more. And uh, you know what, so there's a lot of confusion out there in the low carb and keto world because there's all these different approaches, right? So I usually talk to people and they're like, I've read everything. I'm so confused. Um, and you know what I've seen in, and why there's, you know, a movement out there that says you should eat higher carbs for some people is that what I've seen is that the people like you, you explained that they're already lean, they're already fit. They, you know, they're, they're healthy already. Uh, they don't need this extreme keto diet. They can do well and thrive on a, you know, what we would call a higher carb approach, which is still low carb, but um, they don't need that extreme. And they actually, their body, you know, can, can have a higher tolerance. Whereas the people that I work with, they're so metabolically damaged and they've been overweight for so long and, and they're either unhealthy symptom wise or they're unhealthy inside. You just don't know it yet. They think they're still healthy. And for them, um, their body's not going to be able to tolerate that, you know, that, you know, higher carb, still lower, you know, still low carb, but a higher carb approach. Um, and so that's where a lot of the confusion comes in is that, 
the people that I work with that are very overweight and are struggling with that for a long time. And then they see all these higher carb approaches and they're like, why can't I can do that? Right. Cause I like carbs. Um, so they get a little confused there, but that's a good designation or a distinction is that, you know, where, where are you at? What's your metabolic state going into this and what, what approach is going to fit you? So there's no one approach, right? Yeah, no, I could, I could not agree more. Um, and that's why I, I say over and over on my blog, I try to distinguish between the ketogenic diet and a low carb diet, because most people will do just fine on low carb. Um, and it's, I, uh, oh, I have a huge, huge blog, like many blog posts in the works about this. They're already written. I just haven't put them up yet. I, I don't even know really where to begin. It's really just um, what's right for someone is not right for everybody else. And it's, I'm not saying that people who have a higher tolerance have to eat more carbohydrate. I'm saying they can if they want to. They shouldn't be scared because somebody on Facebook said, you can't eat more than 30 grams of carbohydrate or your insulin is gonna spike and your blood glucose is gonna spike and you're, you're gonna get diabetes if you eat beets. <laughs> I mean, come on, like I, th it's, it's really getting ridiculous. And I think it's, it's like I said, we, we've done this to ourselves. Like we've made people scared of perfectly benign foods. Now, when I say perfectly benign, Obviously, I don't mean perfectly benign for the people that are very metabolically behind the curve. They, they've been overweight or diabetic or insulin resistant for decades. No, that person probably shouldn't eat beets and lentils and parsnips. But if there's somebody who has never had a metabolic problem, and they're a minority in this day and age, but these people do exist, people that were raised maybe on more wholesome foods, that were more active their whole lives, they do have a higher tolerance you know, and they can eat upwards of, you know, 100, maybe more grams of carbohydrate a day, 150, and be fine. You know, when you already have a problem, the solution is different than the solution or the, the, the method that prevents that problem happening in the first place. And I, I use the example of an insect infestation in your house. When you have an insect infestation, you call the exterminator and they set off a bug bomb and it kills the, you know, it kills the bugs. That doesn't mean that you have to have the exterminator fumigate your house in order to prevent bugs in the first place. So it's the same thing. You don't have to follow an 80% fat ketogenic diet to not become diabetic. If you've never been diabetic, if you're lean, if you're not insulin resistant, um, you know, for the people that are metabolically healthy, nobody became obese or diabetic from too much, you know, orange pepper, from too much, too much beets, and, and like I said, parsnips and rutabaga, like, that is not what is making people sick. When yeah. you are already sick, you probably have to avoid those foods. But if you're not sick and never have been, you're not going to get sick from eating, you know, too many lentils. Amen. Oh, that's, a, this is, a, I think this is a, a good message to get out there. And I know when I first started on my keto journey, my cohort from school, they would ask me um, kind of along these lines about like, um, you know, do you think everyone should start from day one? Like, should we be eating this extremely low carb diet? Is that what's wrong? Or is this something that's only necessary because of the um, unhealthy state that we've got into. And so that's, that's exactly the same place that I, my conclusion that I've made. And, and I'm really curious, um, you know, going forward, I don't know if it's going to take a hundred years where we kind of get to reset our population and um, you know, what our health is going to be like as we've taken more of our moderate approach to carbohydrates. But my fear <laughs> My fear is that we won't even get that reset because I think that only happens if we focus on real foods. And my fear is that we've got all these companies now that are starting to come out with these processed, refined, low carb foods that aren't going to be any healthier for us than, uh, you know, the, the low, the low fat processed stuff we're eating. What do you have any thoughts on, on that or? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. But first, I mean, before I, I say that, I, I do want to make it clear because I'm saying like, oh, no one ever got sick from eating too many beets. In, like for the people out there that don't know me and don't read my blog, 
I am definitely not against ketogenic diets. I love ketogenic diets for the right purpose. I love very low carb diets. Like I'm right. I wrote a book about ketogenic diets for Alzheimer's disease. I definitely respect and understand the therapeutic utility. Like I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying it depends on the context. So I don't want people to think, oh, she doesn't believe in, you know, eating less than 30 grams of carbs. I do, depending on the person. So about this other point, um, I think you're right. I think, I don't know if you're familiar with pot injurious cats, but we are living now. Yeah. Yeah. We're living like in the third generation of pot injurious cats where everybody, it's, it's going to take multiple generations to write this ship. It's not going to happen overnight. And um, it's, it's going to take a lot of doing because for all of the growing popularity of this type of eating, there's an equal pushback from the grain industry, from the yeah. soy industry. Um, you know, even Harvard university, every time they come out with a study saying a high fat diet is good for you, then they publish something the day after that says, don't eat saturated fat. Um, <laughs> so like fat is good for you as long as it's not saturated, you know, whatever. Right. <laughs> so I think it, it's going to take a long time. And, um, this again, totally politically incorrect. incorrect. Um, Sally Fallon from the Weston Price Foundation. You know, they they have their own issues, and I, I don't agree with everything the Weston Price Foundation does. They've got some tinfoil hat stuff that I don't approve of, but <laughs> they do regarding like animal husbandry and proper farming and good getting back to nutrient dense foods. They're they're a hundred percent. You know, I love them, but. So Sally Fallon, the head of this organization, calls this the natural selection of the wise, because we are at the point now where women and men who have been raised on garbage diets and whose parents were raised on garbage diets are infertile. Mm, the unfortunate. Yeah. So the, the you've people, seen the movie Idiocracy, or have you not? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> the thing is the people the people who eat this way and who've been eating this way for generations literally can't conceive, or if they do conceive. Why do we think so many children have so many problems? In the womb, in utero, they're completely nutrient deficient because the woman is nutrient deficient. So yeah. how, she doesn't even have enough stores for herself. How is this baby whose entire food supply is coming from her body? These babies have nothing. They're born already behind the curve and it only gets worse. So my, the thing is, because of modern medical miracles, these people can be fertile and conceive, can conceive children when natural biological processes would actually prevent it. So I'm, I'm like, I'm not trying to be, this is a really touchy subject and I'm not trying to say like, oh, if, if you couldn't conceive naturally, you shouldn't. But if you can't, you know, go beyond what the doctor is saying, oh, just give you these hormones, just take these pills. Why is your body not able to carry a child why what nutritional messages are other from circadian rhythm what you know life and diet inputs is your body getting such that your body is saying this is not safe to have a baby right now because i don't have the nutritional resources my i'm stressed out this is not a proper time to bring a child into the universe um but they still are whether it's because of ivf or just other treatments um you know, and I'm like, if a woman wants a baby, have a baby. Like, I'm not trying to badmouth it, but I, I do worry because this is, we're going to have entire generations of children who can't communicate. They can't look you in the eye. They can't sit still and learn. It's really troubling. And it's, it's going to take multiple generations to turn that around. Yeah. And like you, a lot of people may be not familiar with the, the Pottinger's cats, but um, that was research back in the, what, the 20s or 30s yeah that the 30s i think maybe 30s where he's he found that um a poor diet not only affected that cat's life but what is it three generations or two generations after that cat that even if the offspring ate a perfectly healthy diet that they still had uh severe health problems because of their it was a grandmother's what it was like at least two generations later that yeah it was at least two and i think it took at least two or three to correct the the problems and, and and the cats you know you can see it reflected in people today these cats had their coats were not shiny they, they you know the fur was not the way it's supposed to be so you look at people today and look at their skin look at their hair everybody's skin is so sallow and people like they don't have bright color they don't look vibrant they look i don't know what the word is they just don't look well they don't look robust um and and some of these cats were violent uh the women were more the the females were more violent the, the males were more docile and what do we see happening in human society? That's happening. And whether that's good or bad, I, I can't comment that, you know, people might have different opinions, but the fact is it's happening. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, it makes uh, for good uh, hair and skincare products. So if we have a, <laughs> if we if we need those things, so right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so um, you know, going back on the 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 topic of you know you as a writer and then transitioning into this whole fasting thing. So you were a contributor in um, a recent book that came out the. Complete Guide to Fasting, I think is the name of it, right? I can, I yep, can actually yep. have the book right here. So this is a, I, I, lo I love this book. And I know it's also a, you know, a controversial topic because it, it really hits on that, what we were talking about earlier about those people that are trying to have the perfect diet and the perfect, uh, um, perfect health and they want to jump on the fasting bandwagon, but it's not for everybody as well. And so um, let, let's talk about, um, let's talk about fasting. How did you... How did you get into it? Um, we'll start there. <laughs> um, I, I think I started to appreciate the benefits of it when I was doing my Alzheimer's research, you know, and people were talking about the, um, the benefits of it before then. And I kind of, you know, it makes sense. I knew about it, but um, it just, it just makes sense. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a zealot. I'm not even a proponent I'm I'm I support it when it's proper you know I it's just like like we said before you know who is this person is fasting an appropriate thing for them and I think not everybody needs to fast but I think it's not a bad idea to just be hungry every now and then you know this is normal like let yourself be hungry the second you feel hungry you don't have to reach for a snack yeah. You know, like, like there's all these, all these people asking questions on keto boards. What should I have for a snack? What do you do when you get snacky? Well, why are you snacky? Are you not eating a big enough meal? If you're eating big enough meals or meals that are balanced enough in the protein and fat and carbohydrate that's appropriate for you, you shouldn't really be snacky. And I mean, it's okay if you are, like, I'm not trying to, I, I don't want to sound like, Meh, you shouldn't snack. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> if you want a snack, snack, but so much of snacking is just psychological. Like, you're sitting at your desk at the office and you get the munchies. So, oh, I'll have some pretzels. I'll have some crackers. You know, if you ask yourself if you're really hungry, actually hungry, you're probably not. Right. Yeah. Or so if I'm, you are hungry, I, if, I'm if on day two right now of a, of a planned three day fast. Oh yeah. And this is my second one that I've, I've done. And, um, you know, my, it's funny. Some, I was, you know, I, I do video uh, of my experience and share that with my program members and so on. But, you know, somebody was commenting, you know, they kind of summarized my experience with fasting um, in that keto healed my body. Uh, fasting healed my, or, or wait, wait, they, they said it much better. It was like keto healed my, my body's relationship with food. And then fasting is healing my psychological relationship with food and and it's just it, once you're in ketosis you really don't feel hungry and it's all the psychological thing and whereas you know my my thoughts before keto were like this would be just cruel and unusual and it would just make people really hungry and that's a terrible thing to ever impose on anybody to make them hungry and uh the the truth is that it it does help you help me um take a pause and go, why, why am I having an urge to eat right now? I'm not physically hungry. What's going on? Oh, that was really disappointing. And so I had the urge to go eat to make myself feel better. Or, um, wow, I've been working and sitting at my desk for the last four hours and I need a break from work. I need to go take a break and not go eat. And, and so all of that has been really, really um, fascinating and empowering for me to really experience and just kind of dissect that a little bit more instead of just being reactive. And the, the other thing that it reminds me of, and I don't know if, if you remember this or not, um, this was a psychological study was done and I remember it being shown on Oprah's show and you're, you're about, I think you're about ten, eight years younger than me, but Oprah had this episode where she um, showed and maybe it wasn't even Oprah. I don't know. It's all blending together now, but it was, they gave little kids a choice so they could have one marshmallow right now oh, or, if they, or if they waited whatever amount of time, I don't know, it was like five or 10 minutes, then they could have two marshmallows. And then they followed up with those kids. It was something like 20 years later. And what they found was the ones that had impulse control, the ones that could wait and have two marshmallows later, they actually were much more successful in all areas of their life. And this make this is uh, this 
um, you know, it reminds me of that as far as like our eating impulses. And, and um, so many, you know, we have this, you know, this spectrum of people, the ones that give into every single eating impulse that they have. And those people tend to be um, more overweight and have more metabolic problems. Whereas, you know, then we've got the farther extreme, the people that are restrictors that, you know, have their own health issues because they never respond to their eating issues. But people that can have that, you know, like, I feel a little hungry, but I'm going to wait um, because that's going to be better for me um, in a lot of ways that that's associated with, with greater, with greater health. So um, that was a long, no, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's interesting because I think I, I do recommend that people become fat adapted before trying to fast. It just, I know when I was a kid, I'm Jewish. So we would have to fast on Yom Kippur and like, I'd be starving and like irritable and just like so hungry. And yeah. right now, if I fast, like whatever, like it's even, even if I feel hunger, I'm not uncomfortable. I'm just hungry. I'm not irritable. I'm not angry. You know, I'm just hungry. And with the, so I think it's, it's much, fasting is easier once you're off the blood sugar roller coaster. That's for sure. Like once you're, you're even yes. out fueling yourself on fat, but, um, I think what, what you said is right. I mean, I don't, I can't really comment on like the, the success of those people later in life, but if, <laughs> if people are hungry, like, Oh, I want a snack. If you're not hungry enough for a full meal, don't have the snack. See if you can wait an hour or two and then just have a full size meal. I feel like that's better, especially for people that are insulin resistant or, or, you know, really metabolically um, off the rails because that just, the constant eating, even if you're eating low carb foods, the constant snacking isn't doing you any favors. Yes. Yeah. What people, a lot of people don't realize is that each time they eat, even the perfect ketogenic meal, they're getting an insulin re release from that. And right. it takes the body some time to recover from that. So by constantly eating, like you said, it's a symptom of uh, something. It's not that you're a bad person. Uh, it, it's a symptom that something in the body isn't um, you know, working right. And it's, a, you know, we've been conditioned that you need to eat every two to three hours to keep your metabolism up. Yeah. But I'm so glad of what, what you said before about, um, the fast and it's, I, I've never heard this before, but it's so great. Um, keto or low carb healed your body's relationship with food, but fasting has, you know, maybe I hate the word corrected. Cause that's like, nobody's incorrect, but fasting has normalized maybe your, yeah your mind's relationship with food. Cause that, that's what I was saying before. Like if you're, did I just lose my whole train of thought? <laughs> you know, when you're like, when you're hungry and let's say you're fasting, so you're hungry, you're, you want to fast. Maybe it's 12 hours, maybe it's 24, maybe it's 36, whatever it is. If you've already decided ahead of time that you're just not eating, I'm not going to eat, you know, you'll have water, coffee, something, but I'm not going to have food. Then it's, Hello. Oh, that was just a second. We lost. Sorry. <laughs> that was my phone. <laughs> we're doing this. People who were watching, we're doing this over my phone. So I had to, I got a call. So, um, when, when you're fasting and eating is just not an option because you've decided ahead of time that it's not, um, in terms of normalizing your mind's relationship with food, you sort of see, okay, I'm hungry, but I'm not literally going to die if I don't eat. I can actually go 24 hours without eating. I'm hungry. Maybe I'm a little uncomfortable. Maybe I wish I could eat, but I can still go about my business. I can still go through my day. Like, okay, you're hungry. So what? You know what? Like it's, we've, we've forgotten that it's okay to be hungry. You know, we don't have to give in to every impulse we have as soon as we have it. You know, how many times have you wanted to kill a coworker or you wanted to like kill somebody <laughs> on, on the highway when you're stuck in a traffic jam? You don't do it. You know, maybe right. you would if it was easier and there were no consequences, but like, it's, it's the same thing with food. You have this urge to eat, just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why is food the one impulse that we constantly give into uh, out of fear? Well, probably a lot of people I think are still on that blood sugar roller coaster. And so then it ends up being, you know, a, a biological compulsion rather than a, a choice. And then when you remove the biological component of it, then you're left with like, the mind game part of it. So I know I'm so glad you said that because it's, it's this thing about willpower, right? Willpower and discipline. And what people don't realize is once your body's 
metabolism or whatever you want to call it has become normalized. Once, once you are not on the blood sugar roller coaster, you don't need willpower to avoid junk food. You don't yeah. want it anymore. That's the yeah. thing. Like people, like I used to work in a big office and there would be donuts, there would be junk. I'm like, I'm not a nut every now and then I would have something, you know, I'm not, I'm not like super 100% strict all the time, but most of the time I would just walk past it. It wasn't even on my radar. I didn't want it. It didn't tempt me, but it wasn't because I had all this willpower or like I was white knuckling it. Like, Oh, I really want that jelly donut, but I'm not going to have it. I didn't want it. And when you don't want it, you don't need willpower. You don't need discipline to not do something that you don't want to do in the first place. Yes. I so, I so agree. I, I always say that when you, when you get your biology lined up, then it becomes really easy then to, um, to re to resist those things because you just don't want it in the first place. And exactly. You, you don't have to resist because the temp the temptation's not there. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, I always say your biology is more powerful than your, your, your willpower for most people. It's, it's, it overrides it. So when you get off that blood sugar roller coaster, get a steady stream of, of fuel coming in, then you have, you have choices in life then. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, Let's talk about your, your research with Alzheimer's. I mean, that's something that hits really close to home for me. I have, um, I don't have any other grandparent. Well, I, I have one grandparent that's still alive that's in his 80s that has pretty severe dementia. Um, I know with Alzheimer's, they can't technically diagnose it until after, you know, someone's, someone's dead. But um, I, you know, I have a grandmother on my father's side that died at the age of 80 from complications from dementia. I, last summer, my maternal grandmother died in at 80 from complications from dementia. Um, I just had a great aunt that passed away. Um, she had a, a massive stroke while, you know, um, which is kind of all the same thing, right? And um, um, so what, so I'm, I'm, you know, one of the many things that keeps me going on my keto approach is that I want to have the, the, le the least chance possible of developing that or having issues with that. Now, I, I, realistically, I realize I probably, you know, I'm 40, almost 46 years old. And at this point, I'm sure I've got some brain stuff that's already happened in there that's, that may not be reversible, but I want to give myself the best chance of not going down that road. So um, how did you get interested in um, Alzheimer's research? Um, I, when I was doing that, that degree in nutrition, I had to write a thesis and um, you didn't have to do original research. Like you didn't have to conduct an experiment yourself. You could do a liter literature review. So that's what I did. Um, when I read Good Calories, Bad Calories, probably most people have heard of that book. I read that book and there's a chapter in it that covers dementia, cancer, and aging. And it's the first place I ever heard of a possible connection between glucose, insulin, and Alzheimer's disease. And it was interesting to me at the time, but I don't have any family history of Alzheimer's whatsoever. So it was okay. kind of like, oh, well, that's interesting. You know, I'll file that away to study some other time. And then when it came time to choose a topic for this thesis, I said, you know what, what is a topic that I would like to learn more about and that hasn't been written about a million times um and obviously I, I would have wanted to do something focusing on low carb and i said i'm going to go back to that alzheimer's thing and see if there's any basis in that like see if i can find some studies like do a pubmed search see just you know preliminary information and i was just absolutely inundated with articles <laughs> and um i couldn't believe it and i was like why is this the first I'm hearing of this? Why is this all over the medical literature and nobody's telling people? Nobody's telling people who need it the most. You know, if you're a caregiver or a loved one of somebody with dementia, you don't have time to read the, the scientific journals. You don't have time to learn about medium chain triglycerides and ketones and brain fuel metabolism. Like you're too busy trying to get this person dressed and trying to get them from wandering out of the house. I mean, it's really sad the people that need this information the most don't have the time nor possibly the 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 basic fundamentals of even like biochemistry to even understand some of what they would read so um i did i did the thesis and then about two years later i turned it into like a little ebook that um 
you know, people have bought off my website. It's just this little ebook. And then last, no, I guess it was, it was several months ago, a, a, a quote unquote real publishing company approached me to make a book of it. So it's been completely rewritten, um, updated with more, more data, better data, newer data, all of which only serves to strengthen my argument mm -hmm. that Alzheimer's is a metabolic problem. It's a fuel problem in the brain. It's a glucose and insulin problem in the brain. And there's a lot of different interventions and things that need to be done but the number one most powerful place to start is feed those brain cells some ketones so i just i don't i get i don't really know even why i was so fascinated by it except that it's such a beautiful solution and it's such an obvious solution and nobody's talking about it it's like you found it's like you found a treasure and it was right out in the open and why couldn't anybody else see this i can imagine i can totally understand even if i didn't have the family history i have i can understand how that was so exciting like why is this not out there why do people not know yeah and it's um i think i think some people do know or maybe some doctors know it's 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 a growing field definitely it's starting to flourish um that that there is there's been a lot more articles on mct oil and coconut oil for alzheimer's but i think it's just so hard for people either with dementia or their families and caregivers and even the specialists even the neurologists even the doctors it's really hard for them to even ponder the possibility that we can fix this with a diet maybe not a diet alone but a good starting place with a really radical change in diet that you can actually do something about Alzheimer's. Like this isn't hopeless. It's not um, completely mysterious. You know, they still act like, oh, we have no idea what's causing this. We have no idea what to do about it. And that kills me. It's, it's the aluminum in the deodorant, right? Isn't that what causes it? Oh, de yeah, definitely. And, and you're, you, you didn't do enough crossword puzzles. Right, <laughs> yeah. You should, you should have done more Sudoku when you were young. Sorry, it's too late now. Yeah, yeah, you stop wearing deodorant and then you'll be fine. Yeah. Well, and, and um, you know, and, you know, looking at my, my aunt that just, just passed here recently, like looking at, um, you know, she ate a quote-unquote healthy diet. Like when I would go and stay with her, her fridge was filled with, you know, veggies and um, margarine and low fat everything and low fat skim milk and um and you know knowing what i know and also you know if any of my family members are watching this i know everybody treated her with the utmost respect and love and everyone was doing what they knew to do and then you know when somebody's already in their mid 80s it's kind of like well you know let them keep eating the foods that they're used to eating we don't want to make any big changes right and and you know one of the things that she had because a lot of times she didn't have an appetite um you know that she had the you know I, i'm i'm always hesitant to uh, mention brand names so you know the the liquid uh, vitamins drink that and that older adults are encouraged to drink right so she always had that in her fridge and that that she was um you know she you know, was always said like, well, if I'm not hungry, I at least have to drink one of these, but it's really high and it's like corn syrup, right? Like it's just sugar and it's like a chocolate milkshake with some vitamins in it. And, um, you know, she was doing that because she felt like that was really helpful and it was protecting her health. And, um, and, and the thing is like, I totally get it. And the thing is you can't blame her because she, she right. thought she was doing the right thing. Her doctor mm -hmm. probably told her to do that. Yeah. This, this Alzheimer's, this is a tsunami like we have never seen before. We have all the baby boomers. My dad is 71. Um, you know, this, I mean, thank God he doesn't have dementia, um, but this is a coming epidemic, the likes of which we cannot even imagine. We have millions upon millions of people who are going to require round the clock care. You know, their family members have to quit their jobs to take care of them. These people are going to be on disability, on assistance. It's crazy. And these older people, um, you know, you were talking about there's, there's the dietary factors. Don't even get me started on the statin drugs mm. and the prescription antacids, the proton pump inhibitors, the acid blockers, because this is, the brain is built out of cholesterol. The brain is literally like just loaded with cholesterol. And when we have these people taking these drugs for upwards of 20 to 30 years, well, let's say your cholesterol is quote unquote high, which is a whole other topic. Your doctor's worried about your cholesterol when you're in your 40s. You go on a statin. Well, by the time you're 60, guess what? You have dementia. 
And and same thing with the with the acid blockers, because what ha and, and these drugs are only designed to be taken for the short term. You're not supposed to take a prescription antacid for 10 or 20 years. What happens when you've spent 20 years not absorbing sufficient B12, not absorbing sufficient zinc? You probably are already not even eating any DHA, so you're not even getting that. I mean, and these these are things that are fundamental to proper brain health. And pro proper brain structure, literally the physical structure of brain cells needs these nutrients. And what do we expect? And that's like, that's why I wrote this book. Like none of this is a mystery. None of this is um, surprising or illogical. It's a hundred percent logical, a hundred percent predictable. And it, wor like, it, it worries me even more because now we have so many people on statins and you just mark my words, what's going to happen to these people in 20 or 30 years? They will have Alzheimer's period. Wow. Yeah, you know, statins are just so commonly recommended. And, you know, the people that I talk to, none of them have been told any of the the side effects that are possible or likely or anything. They're of course just like, not. oh, my doctor told me now, to take this. And Diabetes, elevated risk for diabetes is a yes. risk factor from statins. And we type 2 diabetes is one of the biggest factor, risk factors for Alzheimer's too. Why? Because it's all related to blood sugar and insulin. Yeah. I mean, what is like, why is this? Why is this a mystery? I don't, I, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all, but when you start to connect some of these dots, it's really hard not to start wondering who's at the helms here, who's pulling the strings. Is it the pharmaceutical companies? Is it the grain industry? You know, I don't know. I, I would like to think it's actually really just ignorance. Nobody is out. No one wants to kill us. No one wants us to get demented. They honestly still think that you shouldn't eat bacon and you should eat your, you know, special, okay, well, I'll use brand name, you know, I'll, you're, <laughs> you eat your, your corn and wheat cereal and you should cook with <laughs> soybean oil. Like I, maybe there is some degree of business interests and follow the money type thing, but I would rather just believe that these myths about food are so persistent that they've just come to be accepted as fact, even though they're not. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's hard. It's hard to turn that around. I mean, it's really hard to, you know, and, and you were saying with, I think it was your aunt or, or somebody who was, who was 80 and it's, you know, it's, it's like, she's already demented. Can't we just let her live her, her last two years of peace? We're not going to force her to follow this diet. And I talk about that in my book, you know, it is going to be really difficult to get someone to change their diet at that age, even if they're under the care of someone who can provide a hundred percent of their food. Um, it's very hard to do that. Um, and that's why I say, like, I, I even say this in the book, if you are able to implement none of what's in this book, except this one thing, do this one thing. And that's loading them up with coconut oil or MCT or even exogenous ketones, which I'm not a huge fan of, but like if, if they will make no change to their diet, no change to their sleep, no change to anything, the, at least sneak coconut oil into them however you can that that's awesome i was just going to ask like what tips do you do you have so yeah because you could i mean if somebody will drink the the chocolate adult uh vitamin drink <laughs> um you could make a real you know a delicious um mct oil based you know chocolate milkshake with heavy cream and and um it, it, probably most people would easily it would be delicious, even better. Yeah. Make it with full fat coconut milk. I mean, that's yeah. loaded with, with coconut fat, but oh yeah. 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 But it's, I mean, it is hard. Like I have no illusions about how difficult this is, you know, especially with older people whose disease is very advanced. They're belligerent. They're, um, you know, they, the emotional outbursts, like you're not going to get that person to give up their toast and orange juice. Like it's just not going to yeah. happen. Yeah. So at the very least, give them some MCT oil, you know, and maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's not. And I, I do think, unfortunately, there's probably a point of no return. Meaning mm -hmm. if somebody has been so sick for so long, there's probably, you can't reverse it no matter what you do, which is why it's so important to do this as, as soon as, as, as early as possible. Like, because we're not, we're not talking about people in their eighties and nineties anymore. I mean, Dementia is never normal, but you could almost say for somebody in their 80s or 90s, it's much more understandable that you do naturally just have some brain atrophy. But we're talking about people in their 50s and 60s 
with early onset Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment, that's not normal. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, after my car accident, I had uh, brain scans to, to make, you know, to see what was going on, where all my symptoms are coming from. And they found, you know, some um, what they call white matter disease, which basically shows that already that I've got some areas of my brain that are starting to atrophy. And I'm freaking out reading this report. And my neurologist is like, Oh, you know, don't worry about that. That's, that's normal. And I was like, that's normal that at 40 some years old that my brain is already starting to, to de decline and atrophy. I think, I think we've confused common with normal. <laughs> like, Oh, your, your fasting blood sugar is 126. That's normal. That's right. normal. No, it's common. That doesn't mean it's normal. Right. Right. Oh, you're, you know, you're, I, I don't even know what, like I was going to talk about weight, but I hate talking about weight. So, you know, oh, you're, your diabetic what. A1C is seven. That's yeah. good. <laughs> see, oh, that's normal. We see that all the time. No, no, yeah. no, 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 yeah. no. You see it all the time because everybody's sick. <laughs> so do you have, okay. So in your, your research or, and plus with your common sense, um, oh gosh, I want to say like where, or ask like, you know, at what point is it most important to start preventing Alzheimer's and dementia? Or, you know, people that are watching right now, what, what can they, they do if they've got a family history of, of dementia and Alzheimer's, like they're headed down that road, right? Like if they don't do anything different, is that what you, what you found or? Um, yes and no. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's in the family doesn't make it a death sentence. It doesn't mean Alzheimer's is a genetic disease. There are certain genetic risk factors that make you more susceptible, but that's what it does. It makes you more susceptible. It doesn't program you to get Alzheimer's no matter what you do. Um, and I, it's, it's, you asked a really good question because I, I don't, like, like we said at the beginning, I don't think a strict, just because I think a ketogenic diet can halt and possibly reverse Alzheimer's, I don't think it's required to prevent it. What I do think is required to prevent it is a lifetime or as much of a lifetime as possible of proper glucose regulation. If you don't quote unquote break your blood glucose and insulin management systems in the first place, then you don't have to fix them. So that, that for different people, that means different things. Some people will be able to eat 150 grams of carbohydrate a day from, you know, oranges and grapefruit and, you know, sweet potatoes and, and starchy food, you know, starchy vegetables and fruit, maybe even small amounts of grains, as long as they don't tip the scale, you know, as long as they don't like cross the threshold into a bad territory. But if thanks to all the testing we have now, you'll know when that's happening. You can monitor your blood glucose, you know, you can do it at home, but I mean, even at the doctors every six months or every year, you'll see where you are and you can course correct if you need to, how are your triglycerides? How's your fasting insulin? Um, and it's, it's unfortunate that most doctors don't really know how to interpret these tests, but we do. We don't have to leave it to the doctors to at least make sense of our own blood work. And um, so I think, you know, definitely proper glucose regulation, um, good sleep, stress management. You know, we, we do underestimate the value of these things. Staying active physically, there's a lot of connections between physical activity and like brain stimulation. Um, I don't think that means everybody needs to run triathlons, but you have to just, it's, it's so much easier than we think it is, but it sounds complicated because most of us are so far from this type of lifestyle, from a whole foods, you know, here's the thing. If you are raised on whole foods from the beginning, which could very well include beans and some, you know, starchier foods, but you've never had Mountain Dew and you've, I'm sorry, I'm using the brains. You've never had like sugary <laughs> soda and you've never had sugary cereal and you've never, or maybe once in a blue moon, like it was a treat, like these things are supposed to be. Not like when I was a kid where I ate this stuff every day. I feel like because of the way that I ate and I was a major couch potato when I was a kid, I'm a nerd. I would rather sit and read a book for five hours than be outside playing. I mean, not, not anymore, but when I was a kid, because of the way I ate and lived in those formative years, I now do not have the wiggle room and the flexibility to eat the kinds of things that other people can who did not have the same diet I did when I was a kid. 
So I definitely think it starts early in life. It probably starts in the womb, but that doesn't mean that you can't course correct in your forties or fifties, you know, but I think just eat, eat whole real food and, and real food is a vague term. You know, that's yeah. some people think fat free yogurt is a real food, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I guess I just say like, if you don't, if you're not compromised in the first place, you don't have to uncompromise yourself. Right. But that's, but again, like we were saying before with these strict people following crazy strict ketogenic diets for no reason, that doesn't mean that you need to eat an 80% fat diet your whole life. I mean, that's madness. Yeah. Well, awesome. Awesome information. Oh my gosh. I've been, um, this, I, I've loved everything you've said, Amy. Um, so just, you know, in, in wrapping up, I, I'll have one final closing question for you. But before that, was there anything else that, was there anything else that like you were hoping I would ask or that you wanted to talk about? Um, um, I don't know. We, we kind of covered the more important points and I'm, I'm glad we got to because I, like I said, I'm, I'm getting this reputation for just being angry, but, but I, I find a lot to rant about on my blog, but it's, it's mostly this stuff about people trying to apply very specific solutions to their situation that may not be appropriate for their situation at all, whether that's strict ketogenic diet or fasting or, you know, I don't know what metformin, you know, different, what is supplements. Other people's experiences are a good place to start. It's a good place to get information that you can then see if it sounds like it's sensible for you. Um, and, and I, should I, should I say one more really politically incorrect thing? Um, yeah, I, I, I love it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with some of the language that is being used in the keto community now because it, um, it's, it's approaching a little too close for my comfort to religious evangel evangelism. I don't even know how to say that word, evangelism. People saying, you know, I want to save people. I want to mm -hmm. spread the word. I saw mm -hmm. the light about low carb. I want to help other people see the light. That really scares me. I actually like that turns my stomach a little when I hear that. And I, I kind of agree with it. I understand what they're saying, but I wish that we'd be saying it in a different way because it just, the way we know about keto and the way we know about low carb is the same way someone else knows about God or the afterlife or whatever. And it just, it's just a diet. Okay. It's just food. You know, now I, I'm not trying to belittle it. People have reversed type two diabetes, obesity, heart disease. Like this is literally a life-saving diet, but I, I, I want to be careful about how we, uh, make sure that we are not proselytizing in a way that turns people off. Yeah. No, no keat of, or no cult of keto. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't drink, don't drink the keto Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> well, that you, I mean, you touched on that just briefly the, you know, some of the exogenous uh, supplement companies out there that are maybe going a little bit far into that cultish one, but we'll, we'll leave that topic uh, alone for today. <laughs> and, um, uh, well, so my final question then for you is, I, I think, I think I stole this from Dave Asprey, but I just love this question is, um, or maybe it was, yeah, anyways, uh, what, if you knew today was your last day on earth, what would your final meal be? Oh my God. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I watched your interview with Rob Wolf and it's definitely not going to be soup. I know. Was that surprising? <laughs> because Paul said soup, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> but I hate soup. Um, my last meal, I don't know, but it would be really out of bounds. I was I was about to use the word sinful, but look what I just said about proselytizing. There's, no <laughs> There's no sin. There's nothing sinful about eating. Um, it would probably involve some type of really decadent chocolate cheesecake. Um. Other than that, I don't know. I mean, if it has to be a real meal with like meat and vegetables. No, it's, it, this is your choice. You, you, you know, a pile of Twinkies or, you know. <laughs> it would pro in that case, it would probably be some kind of huge piece of just outlandishly outrageous chocolate cheesecake with like an Oreo crust and whipped cream. Yeah, 
I'd be happy with that. So the, so the comet's like right here coming at you and you're just, uh, <laughs> and I've got my, my spoon, my gigantic yeah. spoon. Like, or the zo or the so zombies are right outside your window. You're like, this is it. I'm I'm going for it. <laughs> but the beautiful thing is, like, cheesecake is one of the easiest things to make keto. You know. Yeah, and the whipped cream you talked about as well. So, yeah. well, and there is a company coming out with keto Oreos as well. So. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Amy, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me today, cross country. Um, and I've just uh, loved connecting with you and everything you've got to say is so important. And I continue doing all the good work you're doing there, the writing you're doing, the blogging you're doing and everything else. And, um, we'll link, you know, your blog and your book and whatever else you want to link, we'll link below in the, the notes. And, um, if you all like this video, give us a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more. Um, and, um, Thanks again. It's been my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Great to talk to you.